the potential costs of my addiction and continuing to use drugs were not that I would die, which I wasn't really concerned about. Like I thought if I die, I die, that's fine. Um, but the the bad situation was I would just spend all of my money, lose all my friends and family, lose the place where I was living, which became a possibility toward the end, um, and would basically just have a really shitty life, just like a really boring, unremarkable life where my brain didn't work very well and I wasn't doing interesting things. And that terrified me. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Win Win Podcast. Today, I am speaking to Kate Hall. Now, Kate is a very dear friend of mine who has had one of the craziest life stories imaginable. She started out as a top performing corporate lawyer in the cutthroat world of Washington, D.C. She then became a professional poker player, which is where I met her. And then she went on to become a CEO and co-founder of a biotech company. However, her life has not always been smooth sailing. In fact, she has gone through arguably some of the lowest lows imaginable including suffering from a drug addiction that very nearly killed her. And on top of that, going through, well, what conventional wisdom would say is a full-on psychotic break. I'm so grateful to her for having this conversation with me, you know, both as her friend who tried to sort of guide her through it as much as I could at the time, but in general, just like her willingness to talk about something so difficult and so personal in such a raw and transparent way. So yeah, this is a, an intense conversation, but I think a really beautiful one, and I hope you find it helpful and insightful. So on that note, let's dig in. We've known each other for many years, but when we first met, it was shortly after you had, well, you had a job as a very high-paid, successful lawyer in D.C. Uh, but if I remember correctly, you told me that you took acid and had a revelation of some kind that made you decide to give all of that up and instead travel the world and become a poker player. Uh, so can you talk me through <laughs> that decision? <laughs> yeah, I think that it came in stages, um, but acid was definitely a big part of the journey. I think... Until the point that I discovered acid, I was living sort of a standard um, a standard lawyer life that I would say I was really focused on just like winning the next level of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, graduated college, went to a good law school because I got into a good law school, went to a good law firm because I got into like a good law firm um, and didn't really think too much about like what the progression had at its end or what my end goal was in life. Um, so I was just living a fairly normal life as a litigator in Washington, D.C., um, had a really great job and just sort of felt like I didn't fit in in a variety of ways. Um, started taking acid with my husband and I think that that was something that really allowed me to like step back from my life and realize that I didn't know what I wanted. I never like tried to examine that um, and would probably end up unhappy if I just continued down the same path. What was it about law, or perhaps it was that specific type of law, that wasn't satisfying to you? Because it seems to me like law is a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we need it in our society. So we, I would assume it is therefore like a positive some type of uh, system. Is that not the case of the particular type of law you were practicing? Or is it more just about the environment? Or what was it? I think that... The legal system is a good example of something that's like very negative sum overall. What? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, th there are different domains, right? But yeah. like, if you think about the overall legal system in the US, um, litigation is extraordinarily expensive, highly adversarial. It colors all sorts of interactions with people like far beyond the scope of the actual legal system because people are always constantly worried about liability. Um, so it's, it's, draining in like a very real sense. It's also just sort of an endless slog through boring work to mm. get to results that aren't particularly exciting or satisfying. 
Um, that's what probably 98% of work as a young lawyer is, even if you have a good job. Um, I also got to a point in my career where I was doing what I thought was like the coolest work that I could be doing in law. Like I was, I was writing Supreme Court briefs. I was like in the Supreme Court. Um, and I still just wasn't enjoying it. So I took that as a sign that law might not be for me. So by saying that you think on net law is a negative sum thing, I mean, that would imply that if we took away Mm -hmm. the current legal system, the world would be better off than what it currently is now. And that seems like a really big statement. I don't think that that's true because I think that there is value in having a rule of law in general. Right. Um, I'm not... I'm not super radical in that respect. Um, I think that in particular, the American legal system has just swung way too far in favor of heavy legal processes Mm. um, and sort of a legal process that is actually less about truth-seeking than about the exercise of power. Um, because so much of winning like a civil suit is just having the right lawyers. Um, right. It's having resources at your back. Um, it sort of manipulates all sorts of relationships, even when they don't touch the law, because certain parties know that they will never realistically be exposed to liability for violating the law, and other parties know that they will be. So this is something that I think you see in like, all sorts of contracts between individuals and large companies um, where the law and the ability to abuse legal process really just gives a sort of like impunity to large companies um, that individuals are rarely able Mm. to fight back against. Is it more an issue because it's just so much bureaucracy? Is it like layers and layers of bureaucracy that it's added in order to, for people to sort of survive within the game? So one, it's an incredibly adversarial system. Two, it's a system where lawyers are, their role is to advocate as hard as possible for their clients. Three, it's a system where lawyers, um, lawyers pay is dictated by the intensity and thoroughness of their representation of their clients. Um, And four, uh, the, the actual legal process sort of builds into it um, the potential for abuse, by which I mean like it is explicitly a goal of lawyers litigating a large case to bury the other side in documents that they have to review, just expend their resources. Um, and that's just like considered sort of fair game under the U.S. legal system. Um, it is not about trying to get to the truth of the matter. Right. It is a war that is waged under the imprimatur of a legal system, basically. Yeah, it sounds so dirty. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's, that's like, you know, in all those explorations of Moloch that I mm-hmm. keep looking into, you know, it always comes down to, like, the design, you know, don't hate the players, hate the game. Mm-hmm. The design of the game is so bad mm-hmm. that it ends up getting exploited um, that power ends up coalescing more and more. The more power you have, the more power you end up getting mm-hmm. because you're just better able to play the game, you know, exploit the rules in your favor yeah. over others. And considering that seemingly the purpose of law in the beginning was to set out as a truth-seeking entity mm-hmm. so that we get, you know, we converge as a society on on fairness and truth and justice and so on. It, it seems like, you know, wh- wh- one of my personal definitions of Moloch is when, you know, what's good for the sort of people a system is meant to benefit and what's good for the individual players ends up sort of decoupling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like what's happened here. So actually it sounds like a lot of, at least like, lit- is it litigation law? Is that what you call it? Yeah, yeah, litigation law is incredibly mollicky as a system. Would you agree with that? I think that law is a good example of that. And like the fee structure of legal practice is a particularly good example of that um, where everybody sort of understands that the way that lawyers are compensated sets up perverse incentives. Um, And people just haven't worked out a lot of good solutions to this, Um, in part because lawyers don't have a lot of incentive to help people work out good solutions to this. In fact, they're directly incentivized for the problems to exist in the first place. That's already like the most perverse thing. Yeah. 
Like they literally don't get paid unless there's some kind of drama. So they are incentivized to create a sort of almost, or at least allow to build a system that is likely to maximize drama between companies. Right. You're not really incentivized to like solve issues. Yeah. You're incentivized to litigate issues. Seems like a problem. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Do you see any like low hanging fruit solutions that could like in an ideal world if were implemented you know could be implemented in law that would even make it perhaps I mean I'm not saying that Mm -hmm. you'd be ever likely to go back to it yeah but like are there some basic things that if you could take a god's eye view to the current law industry and make these tweaks Mm -hmm. that you, you would make them Yeah. So I think that there are a few different things that could happen in a few different domains. So one would be to make the actual process of litigation less susceptible to manipulation and abuse, which would mean things like um, finding opportunities to financially penalize companies and individuals who abuse process to sort of drain financial resources from their opponents. I think there has been some movement in the direction of this in law in the last 10 years. Another level that you could look at things on is like what incentives do law firms have with respect to their clients? And I think that, again, you'll see in the last 10 to 20 years more movement toward alternative fee structures. So not having lawyers charge by the hour, but instead having them charge by like the mm. case or some mm. chunk of work, um, this tends to sort of combat the problem of lawyers trying to find more work to do. But it also creates some problems in the other direction of like, if your if your compensation isn't really tied to effort, then you are incentivized to spend less effort right. doing the thing. But surely win rate is correlated to effort. So if you just tie their compensation to to the win Mm -hmm. essentially you know either the amount or a percentage or whatever you know percentage share surely that would be a more direct alignment that's another alternative that people sometimes use this is actually the the typical structure in things like class actions where lawyers generally won't be paid unless they win um, and then they'll get a significant percentage of the recovery to compensate them for the risk of of doing the case not knowing if they'll win um a lot of lawyers don't like to not know if they're going to be paid Mm. while working on something i mean that's pretty understandable (laughs) but but also then encourage them to not take on cases that 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 are clearly superfluous because that's part of the problem particularly in america right there's this like litigation bloat Mm -hmm. there's just so many superfluous cases and the lawyers right now are like are incentivized to make all of them to be like, oh yes, yes, you should, yeah, you should sue them and so on. And again, if if they if they if they personally internally think it's only like a 10, 20% chance of winning, mm-hmm. then the case wouldn't happen in the first place. And that would reduce like presumably costs for just general society mm-hmm. again, right? Because it's on net extractive. So I think that's true. I I think that it's probably not true that you only want lawyers to be taking on cases that are likely to win because there may be a bunch of different factors besides Mm -hmm. like the justice of the situation that contributes to overall win rate. Um, So I don't think that tying like all or many situations to results is necessarily the right way to go. I think even outside of the class action context, This is another area where people are moving in this direction. And um, increasingly, I've seen law firms willing to take on like a percentage of the recovery as part of the compensation. So they'll have some, maybe like a fixed fee for the work or reduced hourly rate. And then they will have some um, additional amount that's tied to results. I think that tends to strike a pretty good balance, Mm. um, though it's like doesn't work in all types of cases. Mm. No, it's, yeah, it's a like hybrid model, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes, makes sense. It's also super relevant that in most cases, there's only one party that stands to gain financially from the result. So one party will be suing for money. They might get that money, and that's a, a positive result for the lawyer. You can take part of that recovery. If you're defending a lawsuit, you end up not paying money, 
And so there isn't like a percentage of not paying money that you could give to a lawyer. You could like negotiate some other form of compensation based on the result of winning the case, but it gets a lot more complicated than it is for plaintiff side work where you can just say, okay, you get 10%. It just seems such a tragedy to me that smart people, well, any people would have to expend so much of their one life and cognition Mm -hmm. on such a ridiculous thing. Yeah. That's what's so sad. The human capital cost is really, really crazy um, because a large percentage of people who are very successful at law are super intelligent. You could be doing other things. Um, I think that one of the things that motivated me to want to leave law was the recognition that I was basically fungible. Like I, I was a very like highly regarded successful lawyer in my sort of little area of the world. Um, But replacing me with the next best person or like the 20th best person, really it's going to have very little effect on the actual results that you get. And so it's kind of just like this, you know, I don't have a huge comparative advantage here. This isn't something where it's only me able to do this and I get some like kick out of that. And I think that I, I wanted to go in search of things where I felt like I had sort of unique things to offer um, and wasn't just, you know, associate number 20 at this mm. law firm putting in my hours. So you quit and you decided to play poker. Mm-hmm. Was that, uh, did you sort of stumble into it or was it always a dream? I think I I went through a phase, like many people in college, where I would play in like home games right around the time that Rounders came out (laughs) Um, and really enjoyed that and sort of just like filed it away in the back of my head as like, oh, I think I could be good at this. Um, And then shortly before I started thinking seriously about leaving what I was doing, gambling and, and particular poker became legal in the area where I lived. So I started going to card rooms and casinos and learning to play. Um, And it just, I really fell in love with it as a hobby. And I think at the time that I left law, I had some money saved. I felt like I was not then a winning poker player, but felt pretty good about my ability to become a winning poker player if I was like, you know, putting Mm -hmm. all of my attention on that. Um, So it seemed like a really fun thing to do for some period of time while I tried to figure out what the sort of long-term trajectory of my life might look like. What was your favorite bit about the game? Poker is really just like an endlessly fascinating game. Um, There's the saying, something along the lines of, you know, you can learn in a night, it takes a lifetime to master. Mm -hmm. Um, It really just gets more and more complex the deeper that you go. I loved that. I love the competitive aspect of it. I think the one thing that distinguishes me from a lot of poker players was total obsession with and love for um, live reads, like Mm. figuring out what people wanted, um, what their holdings were based on physical stuff at the poker table. So like body language. Body language, yeah. And, And I think... At the particular time that I was playing poker, um, there was a lot of debate and skepticism about whether this was even a real thing. Um, And it was just definitely a real thing um, as far as I was concerned. Um, I think that, you know, I was pretty successful in the time that I was playing poker. I think that I was good for somebody who had my level of experience, but not like incredibly remarkable at the fundamentals of the game, um, like modeling, math, things like that. I think that I was actually exceptional at learning how to read people. And it was just so fun for me and so fascinating. I just loved it. I mean, it's quite surprising to hear. You've never mentioned this to me before because poker has sort of gone through a transition, right? Mm -hmm. Like back in, you know, I, I learned to play in 2005. And back then it was almost all about reading body language and Mm -hmm. sort of feeling out people's vibes and and street smarts essentially 
And then, but that's because we didn't understand the math. We Mm -hmm. didn't know really how it all worked. Yeah. And then obviously now we've got simulators and game theory and, and it's, it's definitely a mathematical game at its core. Mm -hmm. And at least when I go and give talks on this, you know, and people ask me like, oh, what do I need to do if I want to become a professional? I mean, I tell people I don't recommend it these days because it's too hard. Um, But the main thing is that like you cannot be a top player without having the mathematical fundamentals Mm -hmm. anymore. You can't get by on street smart. Yeah. So it's really interesting to hear someone like you say that yeah. because I mean, this is, I mean, okay, this is not 2022 game is quite different to even 2014 game mm-hmm. whenever you were learning. Yeah. Um, but I would have, I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah. Do you think though that's just more because, you know, I think for anyone who learns the game, the one thing that they do have experience in is reading body language mm-hmm. because it's something that everybody does from a young age and reading people in general. We're mm-hmm. always trying to spot, you know, is this person ripping me off right now? Is Mm -hmm. this person telling me the truth? Um, So it wouldn't surprise me that people tend to just like over rely on those skill sets Mm -hmm. as a beginner because Mm -hmm. they don't have anything else to rely on. And why would that not be the case with you? Yeah. So I think to be clear, like I, I took the math and, and other technical aspects of poker very seriously. I studied several hours a day on average and just like really tried to figure out, you know, did all the coaching and tried to figure out, you know, everything that I needed to to be as good as I could be at that point in my career on the basis of of technical stuff. I think that from my perspective, something that people underappreciated was that the margins for technical skill were getting smaller and smaller mm-hmm. over time. Um, became really hard to have a big edge just from skill. Um, I think that people, for the most part, never went back and tried to like think systematically about physical reads. Um, and so there was this conception of them as like very blunt or like not real tools. I spent a lot of time just obsessing about them and like cataloging them, watching videos of people. Like I had a group of friends who just studied physical tells and we would yeah yeah <laughs> like, dark horse I didn't my, know anything <laughs> my, my my two closest friends in poker at the time we would spend like significant amounts of time basically every day talking about live stuff huh. um and I really think that we worked out a fair amount of stuff that was super high value and really instrumental to my success in poker can you share any of them the secrets <sighs> yeah um I like I take it so seriously that I would never share something that somebody else had developed and then Fair. shared with me. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that I developed pretty much on my own was a real fixation on people's arm movements when they're betting. There's like a whole variety of ways that people bet. Like a flourish. But sometimes it's like really obvious where they just like throw chips in the pot or just like stack them out neatly. Um, but there's like just in the sort of fluidity of people's motions, even if they're doing the same sorts of motions, I think that if you correlate them to hand strength, that's what you always have to do when you're trying to pick up tells. Mm. Um, if you you can like establish a correlation between things that were um, that seem sort of trivial on the basis of little information. Um, I had this. I remember I had this like battle of the sexes thing that I did um, against this this male poker player who uh, had a lot of skepticism about my game, shall we say. Um, (laughs) And so we played a series of heads up matches that were recorded and televised. And before that match, I spent a lot of time studying videos of him, like more than I spent trying to prepare technical stuff. And by the time we played, I really think that I could have beaten him like almost without looking at my cards a lot of the time, it was really absurd because he just had so many very clear tendencies. Um, So in that match, I did some things that I think looked a little bit bizarre from the standpoint of like Mm. technical skill, like making folds that people were like, this is obviously a calling hand. Um, But I was just like, he just, he has it. So I, I won't do that. Right. Um, but it was such a huge advantage. And 
in retrospect, I would have like played heads up matches with him over and over and over just because of that. And you did crush him. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so you had quite a meteoric rise in poker, right? I remember we met probably in 2015, yeah. was it? And then shortly after that, you like made a few final tables. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of came out of nowhere. What was your proudest moment during your poker career? <laughs> it was a really sort of funny and fun rise. Um, just because I think that the first way that I got on people's radar in poker was I wrote this, this article about how women are treated in poker mm. and how... Uh, how this leads to them underperforming, in my view. And there was a bit of an attitude with that, like poker isn't that hard. Women can also do this very easily um, that people really pushed back against. And then I just ended up making several final tables, like WPT final tables immediately after that, was leading the WPT player of the year race for a long time, Finally ended up in second, just barely, but it was like, it was a real ride. Um, and it was just really gratifying to experience that happening. Obviously, there's just an enormous amount of variance and stuff like that. And I wasn't sort of under the delusion at the time that I was like the best poker player in the world. Um, but it was fun to just sort of be able to, you know, stuff mm -hmm. that on people's throats a bit. <laughs> What was your lowest moment in poker? I think that actually the, the time leading up to that big heads up match might have been my lowest point. And that I, I think I sort of felt going into it that it was a negative free roll, mm -hmm. meaning that I didn't stand to win very much if I, if I won the match, but losing it would be like, a huge blow to me psychologically just because of the nature of the relationship or interactions that I'd had with this person. Right, because it, it, part of the reason why this sort of uh, grudge match even happened mm -hmm. was because he had been really mean to you on Twitter, right? He, yeah. He was like being very abusive to you over there and like just saying really unpleasant things. Yeah. Really unnecessarily as well. Mm -hmm. Like you had never said anything to him and he just was... Yeah, giving him a little bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, but he came. He definitely picked, he's definitely started the fight. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I think let's be clear on that. I mean, I remember it very clearly. It was also right after the twenty sixteen election, and I think it felt like <laughs> like a referendum or something where I was the feminist liberal, you know, and he was a very MAGA type person um, and was super vocal about it, as was I about politics at the time. It was Trump v. Hillary in the poker world. It really <laughs> was. It really was. Um, and so that kind of dynamic creates a lot of hostility and negativity. And I would say for like a couple months leading up to it, I just had intense, constant anxiety about mm. what if I, what if I lose? What if my friends were betting on me lose? What if, you know, like can't let this type of person beat me publicly. Um, and it was just way too much public attention for me and mm. much of it negative. If you could run it all again, would you do it again? If I knew the outcome in advance, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I think that probably not. I think I was definitely not my best self in that situation in terms of like how I fueled the animosity, how I egged him on. Um, I was just anxious and angry a lot of the time. And I'm not sure if there was a way to navigate that particular situation that wouldn't have involved that. So I'm actually curious to go back to you. You mentioned this blog you wrote about the treatment of women in poker. Mm -hmm. Can you paraphrase it? I think it was... It was basically just along the lines of you might not realize why it's annoying to be a woman at a poker table and the ways in which it can be unwelcoming to women, the game. Um, poker's audience is heavily, heavily skewed male, as you know. Um, and there's just a lot of focus on physical beauty and sort of attractiveness and sort of trivial things, sexualizing situations at the poker table. Um, it just felt like 
particularly coming from a professional background, it felt super retrogressive to me. Mm. I was like, wow, I can't believe that this is, you know, the environment that these people are operating in. Um, I think that there are advantages and disadvantages to being a woman in poker. I think the primary disadvantage is one that I don't see being talked about a lot, which is that it's really hard to form the types of study groups and peer groups that men rely on to succeed in poker as a woman. You're always sort of like, maybe not always, but you're often looked at with a lot of suspicion. Your motives are questioned. There's always this sort of flavor of women who, who align themselves with men in poker are using them in some sort of like vaguely mm-hmm. sexual transactional way. Um, and I think that it's actually significantly more difficult for a woman to achieve an elite level of success, um, primarily for that reason. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, certainly in today, your peer group, your study group is so key. Right. And it used to be, again, it, when there was sort of more abundance in poker, essentially, um, when the game was easier, study groups were more fluid. Mm-hmm. People would just be really sharing of their strategies. You could go on poker forums and you'd see like literally bleeding edge strategies being published on the internet. People would freely yeah. give it. And then as, you know, because obviously there's this this game theoretic, game theoretic optimal ceiling of technically perfect mm-hmm. play, that means there's a kind of cap of how hard, how good you can get. Yeah. And so there's sort of diminishing returns. And, and as everyone's slowly getting, you know, the average person is getting closer to that, um, it means there's less, uh, it, 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 you, it require more work and more mm-hmm. study in order to get that marginal edge. And so you've seen that play out in how now, like there are these like little groups that are very protective over yeah. their strategies. And it used to be 10 people in a group and mm-hmm. then it's like five and now it's mm-hmm. three. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I can definitely see that, see that being the case now that if you aren't taken seriously as a peer, then you wouldn't get access to mm-hmm. those groups. And I could totally believe that a woman, you know, from from my own experience, I would not be, just notice like little, you could just feel it from people, mm-hmm. essentially. It's, it's really hard to put into words sometimes. I would just get this feeling, they're like, oh, and I think I had it probably easier than a lot of other women as well. And that just because of my track record, I had mm-hmm. like, you know, and I'd been around for such a long time, I was taken seriously as a player, mm-hmm. more than perhaps a new female player would get. Yeah. But still... There's always, you're always dealing with this, you know, I, I'm under no delusion that I wouldn't have had my sp- sponsorship deal or had right. all the media attention I had, had I been a male or right. had I not looked like the way I do, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's constantly in the back of my mind. I think that it's a lot easier to become famous and visible as a poker player, as a woman, mm-hmm. as you sort of alluded to. And people can confuse that with success at poker or something. Um And some people are just sort of optimizing for fame and being known. Um, But I think that if you are uh, optimizing for results overall, the effect of like not having peers who are excited to work about you dominates over other things. There are um, definitely some countervailing benefits to being a woman. Um, There is a huge number of people who will just play poorly against you for based on demographic assumptions and they won't adjust because mm-hmm. they're not good enough to do it. Um, and that's that's where a lot of your, your money comes right. from, especially in tournaments where you have a lot of amateur players. Um, they just sort of can't conceive of their preset notions about somebody who looks like something playing a certain way. Have you always been a competitive person? Uh, yeah. So I, I would say that competitiveness was one of my defining qualities for most of my life. Um, to the extent that it sort of dictated a lot of life choices that it shouldn't have, because I just like the feeling of winning and being the best at things so much that I ended up doing things that I didn't care about. I was sort of optimizing for the feeling of success. Um, I think that that definitely carried over to poker. But 
I had some sort of change in the last like five ish years, maybe a little longer, where I just started to feel kind of gross about that and not want to sort of have my personality wrapped up in winning, um, particularly in zero sum games. Um, and so have moved pretty far away from that, I think. Mm. Yeah. So was there like a particular light bulb moment where you suddenly felt like, huh, I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm done with zero sum games or yeah. How did that transition? Because I went through that myself. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons I want to, you know, I'm making this podcast Mm because it's like, I felt I was so competitive to the point of like, pathologically so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and again like so much of my life was revolved around like what is a game that I know I'm likely to win at and I'm going to do more of um so that I feel good Mm -hmm. and uh and I've noticed with me it's been a kind of like slow more more like an erosion or an attrition or you know transition into this new caring more about just like looking for omni win situations or just you know cooperative things as opposed to competitive things but uh, yeah I'm curious like how did that come about in you I think that the seeds were planted some time ago and were sort of like germinating, but the proximate cause was largely having a psychotic break (laughs) five years ago Mm -hmm. um, where I think that that just sort of radically changed my orientation to the world um, and what I was doing. I basically stopped playing poker overnight when that happened and didn't want to return to it after that because it it just felt really stupid to be competing in this kind of meaningless game. Can you talk us through your psychotic break? Like what precipitated this and what did it feel like? That's a fun question. Um, I'm not sure that anybody really knows how psychosis works, but... Uh, yeah, I think I think I have a number of different sorts of speaking about what I experienced that vary a lot depending on the audience. So I think that like the sort of straightforward acceptable version of it is that I had a manic episode that was initially induced by drug use. Um, And that then carried over into sort of a full-blown psychotic manic episode. And that persisted for about three months, basically, um, the really intense part of it, Uh, intermittently for the next year or so. But it was extraordinarily disruptive, life-altering. Yeah, it was just a, a really radical experience. And I think, honestly a really good experience for me on net, though it certainly had its downsides. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll get, we'll get into those. Perhaps you can sort of talk through what the lead up was in terms of, you know, I remember you were, you know, your drug use had increased Mm -hmm. um, significantly. And I just seem to remember one, the the, the moment where I was like, Ooh, I don't think Kate's okay. Mm -hmm was when you you came to stay uh, at my house, mm-hmm. with, stay with me and Igor. And, you know, you were an atheist. Mm-hmm. You'd been a, 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 I considered you sort of like, I was, you know, we were both atheists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we we're very into rationality. And you came in and you're like, okay, Liv, just so you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an atheist anymore. I met God and he's got a very male energy and also a weird, wicked, dark sense of humor. So that's the situation. And then you also started then talking about a lot of more other things that made less sense. Yeah. Um, that was a very like jarring moment. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like a particular moment? Like, did you have a particular drug trip? Mm-hmm. Was it like a trip where you were just like, oh, hey, I'm in... What, you know, like, what does meeting God look like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was interesting. There was a very clear lead up to it where I'd been experimenting with like particular drugs, sort of 
I'd gotten very into a couple of particular drugs because of the sort of effects that they had on my consciousness Mm -hmm. and ways in which I felt like they allowed me to experience different parts of my mind that I didn't ordinarily have access to. So there was this period of experimentation of maybe a few months leading up to it where I really had the sense that I was like trying to come up with the right recipe for something. Um, And it got more and more intense. uh, And this is an aspect of the story that I think might sound weird or crazy depending on your view of what happened. Um, There was like a very clear time when reality just like broke open for me. And I in the like hour before that happened, I was so sure it was going to happen that I like went around taking like photos of everything in my area because I wanted to be able to like recreate it for later experiments. I just really felt like something big was about to happen. Were you already high in that moment? No. No. Oh, so you were sober? Yeah. Yeah. And I basically, uh, I mean, I was doing quite low doses of drugs at that time like very small, Um, but I took this combination and a particular sequence um, and really in a way that no previous drug experience had, and I'd had a lot of drug experiences at that point in my life, um, it was like I reality just broke apart for me. What does that mean? Like, what, what does that mm-hmm. experientially, like, does, does the work, did, 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 did things look completely different? Yeah. So the, the first experience that I had, I think actually like the, the explicit God sort of thing didn't come in until maybe a week or two later. The initial experience that I had was basically I was suddenly removed from my body and saw myself from the outside Then I zoomed out further and saw like, you know, infinite me's in the same room stretching in all directions and this like sort of lit pathway between moments that I was like following with my life. Like a timeline? Like a timeline, yeah. In many worlds or? Something like that. Uh That's kind of what it felt like. Um, And then it zoomed out another level and I, I saw that this was like, basically like a crystal lattice in this larger world where there were sort of not like God, God, but sort of Hindu like deities around me. Um, And uh, I remember like there were these two wheels that they were turning, which had men tied to them, like writhing in pain. Um, And I was so shocked by this and so afraid that I like pulled myself out of the experience. Um, I think that particular imagery is really interesting to me just because of like learning about Buddhism after that and like samsara and... Why? What's samsara? Samsara is like the circle of life and reincarnation whereby people are reincarnated over and over um, and the nature of life is suffering and the point of life is to learn how to escape that like cyclical suffering. And you, but you didn't know about that at the time. I had no knowledge of it whatsoever. I, it seemed like a really important thing to me, but it's not something that I'd ever encountered as far as I know in my life before that. Um, Anyway, I, I pulled myself out of this basically because I was super afraid. Um, and I remember feeling like there was this like river of energy, like psychic sort of energy. Like I, I called it the river of consciousness in my notes after the fact. It was running through my room and wanting to like pull me in to this sort of general unified experience of consciousness. I was really scared by that because I wanted to sort of retain my individual self sense of self. And I was afraid that if I sort of gave into that, that I would disappear in some important way. The experience was so 
categorically different from anything that I had experienced before in my life, that there was no chance that I was going to like have that experience and then not try to figure out what was going on with like all of my energy. Um, so I really threw myself into this. The f- One of the initial experiences that I had after that was trying to go back to the river and allowing myself to enter and feeling myself sort of like dissolved in this universal consciousness. And it was just like incredibly beautiful. And, you know, people talk about like returning to source, returning to home, um, really one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. So Um, was the fear not warranted? I think the fear was not warranted. I think that my experience in general with exploring spirituality and um, like mysticism has been that a lot of things that seem really frightening at first are actually sort of about um, particular self-concepts and like types of like sense of ego that people have and are are reluctant to let go of because they're sort of the self-image that we've built up over the course of our lives. Um, But in moments where you're able to like let go of those things, it really is the most profound, extraordinary experiences I've had in my life. So this was about a week prior to then meeting God. Mm -hmm. What was... How did you know, what was meeting God like and how did you know that it was God? And how was it different to, to say, the Hindu gods that you felt like you saw? Mm -hmm. I think it says something about the way that I experienced this event, that my really strong impulse was to figure out how to replicate it and record it and share it with other people. So the morning after this happened, I went and bought like a fancy video camera and like recording devices and like set up an experimentation space in my house and was sort of, I think I filled like a hundred notebooks during this time of my life, just trying to like record everything that I was thinking and seeing. Um, Because I really believed that this was a real and like the most important experience I'd ever had. And being able to like have some evidence of that or some ability to to transmit it to other people was like the most important thing I could be doing. I think though, you know, sometimes people will profess to like having a belief, but will not really act on it. And to me, my obsessive devotion to sort of cataloging this in the months that followed feels like it's a testament to how deeply I believe that this was a, a real thing that was happening. Um, On to the God point. I I think, so this, this period of time was five years ago, and it's a bit hard to remember, like, the precise chronological order in which I had experiences. I have sort of records of things that I experienced that I go back and look at every once in a while. Um, I would say sometime between, like, three and seven days after I first had this experience, which was followed by subsequent experiences on the next days. Um, That was like the first time that I met God. Um, And to me, meeting God was, it was sort of, so in recovery programs, which I later joined, people talk about having a God-shaped hole Mm. that they're trying to fill with drugs. And I think that 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 experience of like meeting God, um, it's always so funny to say those words, but um, it, it made that hole in my life visible to me because it was filled for the first time. And it just felt complete and uh, safe and loved and all of the things. Um, Just sort of like this like power cord of all the beautiful and profound things to feel. Um, And 
it was like nothing I'd ever felt. It was also tied to this like real sense of a volitional being that was sort of, that I was interacting with. Um, And one that, as I told you at the time, I guess, felt like it had a, a really sort of funny sense of humor. How did you get the sense of humor from it? Did like did it speak words to you? Did you hear like actual words you could understand, or was it just like a feeling? I think that I would describe what it was like as akin to hearing words, but sort of just having messages arise in my consciousness more so than like thinking that I was hearing somebody speak to me or something. Um, there were just like particular types of of phrases that would like well up in my consciousness over and over again when I would have these experiences and would feel like they really pointed to something. Um, And there was that. Um, There was also, I think there there are a number of experiences in this vein, but one, one thing that I think people kind of get when I talk about it was this experience of suddenly flashing back to like all these moments in my life long buried in my like personal psyche or whatever where I had like told jokes that nobody had laughed at at the time (laughs) which was really bizarre like this this like feeling of feeling like an outsider or like not appreciated something like this Yeah. yeah and this just like deep sense of like, no, I got it. That was funny. Like I was paying attention and it it just really felt like this like caring thing that, you know, knew me to a really deep extent. Um, Obviously those are all things that were like in my consciousness somewhere. So Mm. take it for what you will. But yeah, that, I think that's like a good little vignette of what the experience was like. So I can imagine a lot of people listening to this, you know, this is probably a very, well, very polarizing conversation mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah. I think, you know, and certainly for me, when I heard this sort of five, six mm-hmm. years ago, you know, I'd had a few drug experiences myself, but nothing like that mm-hmm. in any way. And I was you know, I I was just like awash in a sea of skepticism and kind of fear, Mm -hmm. basically, because I was fearful for you, my friend at the time. I could see you were fundamentally changed. And I was concerned as to where this was going to go Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what the logical conclusion of this was going to be. Um, And having now like been through nothing on anywhere near that scale, mm-hmm. but a few sort of similar things myself where I've sort of, my my own horizons have been a little bit more opened up to this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I personally can sort of almost like put different hats on mm-hmm. and I can view it, you know, like in one moment I can be like, well, this is like an archetypal, you know, manic episode that goes, goes too long. You mm-hmm. have too much sleep deprivation and then it turns into psychosis and one of the most unifying factors amongst all people who seem to have psychosis is mm-hmm. that they meet God mm-hmm. or they feel that they are God or some mm-hmm. kind of like deity type thing where yeah. they see everything, feel everything. It's usually very blissful, but it's also got a lot of fear and, they, and then they want to get back to that and so mm-hmm. on. So in many ways, it like t- ticks all those classic boxes that a person in a white coat would say. Mm-hmm. But then I put like my spiritual hat on where I've been there myself and, and, and I, this also ticks all those boxes of like, yep, there is this thing that's sort of out there. And until you feel it, mm-hmm. you've experienced it, it doesn't, it, you can't, po- you can't possibly envision or, or like get, get a taste for it. So I, I guess my question is how do you, how do you sort of epistemically navigate this? Do you sort of hold it in terms of like different probabilities of what's likely to be true? Or do you think both descriptions are equally true? We have a really poor understanding of what psychosis is, even what we think it is, where it's really a label that we apply to a set of symptoms and behaviors more so than like a causal mechanism. So I have no compunction about saying that the the behaviors and, and attitudes that I was engaged in at the time fit the definition of a psychotic episode. I think that 
if you look at other cultures and places in time, um, the same set of symptoms would be interpreted in very different ways. Um, and sort of applying the label of a pathology to it can give this sense that we understand the thing that is happening when we really don't, even mm. on a scientific account. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that the primary difference between these two sort of ways of describing what happens is that one entertains the possibility that the cause uh, the cause of what you experience is not limited to things that your brain is generating maybe um, and the other doesn't. Um, I'm not even convinced that that's a very clean distinction, mm. but it's at least a plausible one. But I think you can't like, you can look at the same set of facts and call it a spiritual experience or a psychotic episode, depending on what your cultural background is, the like spiritual community that you grow up in. Um, and so often when I'm speaking to uh, more rationally minded people, when I don't have some interest in like helping them understand what my experience really was. I just use the language of right. a manic episode and that's totally fine. And I don't feel weird about that. You know, you are a rationalist by training, you know, and by that, I mean, someone who thinks about things in terms of uncertainties, you know, you're very comfortable with like living in the gray zone, probabilistic thinking. I mean, poker trains you in that. I assume law trains you in mm -hmm. that. That seemed to mostly go out the window at the time when we were talking about mm -hmm. it. I was like, how certain are you that what you met is God and that it's not just a product of your brain? And what was interesting was that you actually were still able to talk about things in rationalist language, mm -hmm. which I've funny enough had a couple of other friends who've had psychotic breaks and they were not able to mm -hmm. in any way. They were dead certain about the, what they were believing in was real. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they, they were awash in hubris and and had no granularity or nuance to what they were saying. But you you didn't have that. You were able to. You were like, you know, I might be crazy, but this is how it feels. Mm -hmm. And and you were you were able to sort of you were you, still using the language of someone who had like had extensive probabilistic rationality, you know, evidence based mm -hmm. training. So I think it's interesting because I think that there are ways in which rationality helped me. I think there are ways in which rationality really hurt me. Mm. Um, there are definitely ways in which it helped. I think something that felt very obvious to me at the time was that lots of people have experiences that they interpret as talking with God. Most of those people, I assumed, weren't um, or were later embarrassed by or attracted what they said. Um, so I didn't expect that there was a reliable correlation between how things felt and what the reality was or what my later view of the reality would be. Um, and it was kind of just like on base rates, you know, there have arguably been zero verified mystical experiences in like a way that a rationalist would accept. Um, you can use different versions of rationalist and different versions of mystical experience there. But um, it's like, probably this is a thing that people experience a lot and I'm not exceptional. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the way that rationality really got me in trouble and extended my, like, what turned into a serious drug addiction by for a long time um, was there's a concept of, like, a Pascal mugging. Can you explain that? Yeah, let me see if I can. <laughs> so I don't really remember what the initial Pascal mugging is, but it's something of the form a man approaches you on the street and says, give me $5, I'll pay you back $10 tomorrow. And you say like, no, that's not, like the odds aren't good enough, I'm not going to do that, why would you pay me back? And he like escalates the price until it's a billion dollars and the sort of intuition that you're supposed to have is that at some point 
the payoff for something becomes sufficiently large that it makes sense to take the really small probability of a payoff. Yeah. Um, I I apologize to anybody who actually knows what the true Pascal <laughs> wager. I might, I might do a full definition of okay, it, anyway, okay. but yeah, that, yeah, it's definitely good enough. It gets the point. <laughs> Some, it's something like that. Yeah. I think that a thought cycle that I got trapped in was something like it wasn't ha- that hard for me to accept that there was a really low chance that what I was experiencing was like real in the relevant sense that would like justify continuing to explore and sort of do things to my mind um, that were costly. But I perceived that the payoff of being able to do that and being able to like document it and being able to translate it to other people was so high that I should just like keep trying. Mm. And I think I think that this really kept me trapped for a long time because there were many times where I was sort of on the brink of getting out of this, getting out of the drug use, getting out of the psychosis. And that felt like a really tangible possibility to me. And then I would have this like guilt that I was making the wrong decision on like expected value terms. I was giving up this opportunity that while remote was incredibly valuable and that was just a selfish thing to do. Um, And that yeah, that that really got me stuck for a period of like multiple years. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it, it, there is a, I mean, that's the problem of taking, yeah, an extreme utilitarian view, mm-hmm. essentially, right? Mm-hmm. It can get, it, it can lead you to some really non, well, co- uh, lead you far past what common sense would say. Yeah. Um, and I remember trying to reason with you at the time when I was, you know, so worried about the amount of drugs you were doing mm-hmm. and like seeing like, Man, you are chasing something that I don't know even is is real. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't think it was real at mm-hmm. all. Um, I, and I still don't know. Um, but what I could definitely see from the outside was what it was doing to your health. Yeah. Like you were, you know, I was genuinely worried you were going to die. And I remember trying to reason with you in those terms. Mm-hmm. Like, look, if God wants you to give a mess, if God is real and is talking through you, mm-hmm. do you think he wants you to be running the risk of dying and then not even be able to communicate it anyway. Mm -hmm. Did those types of messaging resonate at the time? I think that it was that type of messaging that was ultimately most productive for me. Um, But that I needed to go through like a lot of cycles of abusing drugs to get to that point where I was willing to say, I misunderstood what I was supposed to be doing here. Um, and I think that there's like, there's an effect where the longer I had been doing this and like sacrificing a lot for it, the more important it felt to me that there'd be some sort of resolution of the situation that was appropriate. Like that I would come to some realization or that there would be a time that it felt like, okay, I've done the thing. You know? It'd be like a clear end to the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a, like a nice movie. Like yeah. Nice packaged wrap up. This is it. This is the lesson. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't coming. And that wasn't coming. But you did successfully break your addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually. Um, what, were the, what were the methods you tried to break it? Mm-hmm. And in the end, what was the thing that worked? So, I mean, I tried a bunch of recovery programs in the sense of sort of repeatedly doing AA or NA, things like that, Um, and not infrequently would have some limited success in them and then relapse after a month or two, something like that. Um, I think that going to rehab was really important for me, Um, just having a lack of physical access to the option to do drugs for 60 days. Um, and really giving my mind time to focus on other things through that. I I also think there was just like a lot of thinking that I did and a lot of like minor sort of blocks in the puzzle or something that made it possible for me to quit. Um, one of them, I think, was the the thing that you mentioned, which is like, realizing that 
obviously this couldn't be what the plan was and I just need to like accept that. Another was was coming to the realization that the potential costs of my addiction and continuing to use drugs were not that I would die, which I wasn't really concerned about. Like I thought if I die, I die, that's fine. Um, but the the bad situation was I would just spend all of my money, lose all my friends and family, um, lose the place where I was living, which became a possibility toward the end, um, and would basically just have a really shitty life, just like a really boring, unremarkable life where my brain didn't work very well and I wasn't doing interesting things. And that terrified me. So it was actually the fear of mediocrity. Yeah. You were fine with either a dramatically good or a dramatically bad outcome, but mediocrity was a thing that scared you. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if that's your competitive nature. I think so. I think it, it was it was also some form of self-loyalty where I felt like I'd been through a lot of really difficult things in life and had a had a life that I was very proud of and felt very interesting. Mm. Um, and it just felt like a disrespectful ending to the life of the person that had put in all of that work mm. so that I would have a good life. Yeah, it's interesting because like, I'm try, you know, I want to try and find win-wins in every situation. Mm-hmm. And what I would like the idea, you know, I, I'm curious myself. You know, I, I think it's good that we're not we're deliberately not mentioning the like cocktail of drugs that you were using, yeah. for example. I don't want to incentivize anyone to go out and do this. Yeah. Um, you know, but part of me would like to experience what you experienced. Yeah. But like, does it have to come with the cost that it came with? Mm-hmm. You know, why can't it be, you know, if if I, you know, I my philosophy, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but the philosophy I'm choosing to believe in is that mm-hmm. this can be a positive sum universe and mm-hmm. that there are win-wins in almost every situation. And our job is to just figure out how to manifest them yeah. and how to think about them and reframe it, et cetera. And like your journey, I mean, I, I'm guessing that you would look back on this and be like, you are glad for the experience, even though, yeah. you know, in some universes you probably didn't make it. Yeah. Right. Um but like, is there a way to have the kind of experience you had without the down? I think yes, for at least some people. I think that there's like a, I guess, a body of thought on this in terms of people who write about psychedelic experiences a lot. Like Alan Watts is when you, once you get the call or once you answer the call, hang up. Um, like some people are able to have. What does he mean? I, I think it's like once you once you answer the call of the universe or like receive information that the nature of reality is different from what you perceive it to be, hang up the phone. Like don't keep Just trying. Keep going. All right. Yeah. Don't keep calling back. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Don't, and, don't harass the universe. <laughs> and I think that the nature of my experience was very much just like trying to pry open a door that had been sealed shut. Um, I think that some people are more naturally inclined to that kind of obsessive behavior. Mm. I think that A fair amount of that for me was feeling this responsibility for figuring out how to like share the experience with other people, where if it were a more common experience, it would be, I'd be less inclined to obsess about it. So I actually think that one thing that helped me now that we're talking about it was meeting another person in rehab who had like very, very similar experiences with the same drugs. Um, and who also felt this like profound guilt. Um, and just realizing that there were other people having the same experiences mm-hmm. made it feel like it was less on me to like try to figure right. stuff out. Um, and that made it easier to walk away from. What's your metaphysics now? Do you know, uh-huh. <laughs> do you still believe in God? I do. Yeah. I have sort of like, a hierarchy of beliefs in the sense that there are some things that I believe pretty deeply and some things that I believe sort of lightly or like as stories for myself um, that I don't, you know, take too seriously or wouldn't be surprised to be wrong. Um, I have a very strong belief that there is like a form of reality beyond what we perceive physically 
that is like really relevant and real and that it's the case that when people talk about having spiritual experiences, they're not speaking metaphorically, which is what I always assumed before I had these experiences on my own. I think below that, there's a level of, there's a level of, I interacted with this particular type of God. Not, it's not a very well-defined God in my view. It's definitely not like an omnipotent or omnipresent or whatever God. It's just kind of like a creator who is sort of doing his best or something like that. Um, I think it's sort of the, the most similar thing I know of in religion is like Gnosticism and the Demiurge. Which what are those? Gnosticism involves kind of like a cascading series of gods from like the the one true God that is like ineffable and um, not perceptible and um, it sort of descends through levels of purity and power to uh, the demiurge, which in at least some versions is like the creator of the world. Um, so it's like, he's not the God. He's just the person who created this particular world, sort of the same way that... So like the simulator. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If like, we, yeah, 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 like, those like terms. the video game designer, basically. Right. I think that's a lot closer to what my view of this this thing is. And which one did you think, you know, the one you met, mm-hmm. which matches up? Was it the the original, the OG? No. It was the Demiurge. More like the Demiurge. More wow. like More like a guy who's like trying his best. And it's like pretty good. Like he had a lot of great ideas, but definitely not perfect. Interesting. Right. Because yeah. that, that's always then, you know, I think one of the strongest arguments against like the classic God is all loving, God is all wise, God is all capable, God is all knowing. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, why child cancer? Mm -hmm. Why pedophilia? Why Mm -hmm. torture? You know, why are all these awful, awful things in existence if there is this all knowing, all wise, all capable, all Mm -hmm. loving God? Like, Mm -hmm. it just doesn't make any sense. Right? Yeah. So, like, how do you, yeah, how do you marry those up? This is further down on the hierarchy of beliefs, which is like, I have a number of, stories for this that that seem plausible to me and no real way of like sorting between them like for thinking about the problem of evil in the world um i i it feels interesting to me that anytime you talk about a god or a creator people really attach to sort of like a pure christian you know the God with all of the the things and, and qualities. And I get why that happens, particularly in our culture. But it's actually like, if you think that somebody created this world, there's, I don't see any reason to believe that that thing also created everything as opposed to there being like other, other beings of spiritual significance, other layers of creation. Like if anything, this means that there's a layer of creation that we're not perceiving. So why would you assume that there can't be others? Mm. And having like a single God feels like a very specific case of what God or gods could look like. Um, And I think, I think it gives a misleading impression of what I'm talking about when I talk about encountering God. Mm. So you got out of your uh, addiction mm-hmm. and you didn't go back into poker and you now lead up, well, I mean, you're best to describe it, but you now work in biosecurity, mm-hmm. um, biotech. How did you get there and why? <laughs> yeah. A lot of it was being in the right place at the right time and having certain skills that were helpful. So After I got out of rehab, I decided that I wanted to try to do things that were helpful to other people. Um, And I had been involved to some extent in the effective altruism community and knew what that was about. And so we started looking for ways to sort of insinuate myself in that community and figure out how I could be helpful. Um, And initially that was with my law degree. I was doing sort of independent research on a grant looking at ways that law could be used to reduce bio-risk. And through that, met a bunch of other people in the community and sort of adjacent communities who are working on on bio-risk from other perspectives. Can you define bio-risk? 
Biorisk is sort of like a catch-all term for a variety of different types of risks that go through biological systems. So it can mean stuff like uh, everything from like state actors developing and deploying biological weapons to like stuff that accidentally escapes a lab. Um, arguably, it can also cover things like zoonotic disease, but it's it's basically um, biorisk is a field of study aimed at reducing the risk of a very bad event from sort of some sort of biologically mediated system. Right, right. As opposed to like chemical or, you know, some kind of physics accident or mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So why why biorisk in particular? Because, you know, there are so many different threats to to the world. There are so many, you know, active problems right now, you know, where, you know, you could you could have, for example, gone into uh, global health, mm-hmm. you know, uh, reducing poverty-related diseases mm-hmm. right now, um, or animal wel- welfare. You know, there's just mm-hmm. so many different problems. Why was that particular one the one that drew you? I think the reason why biorisk is somewhat circumstantial, it happened to be something that I thought that my law degree would be useful for, um, a set of problems I thought that would be useful for initially. And there was some sort of path dependency where the people that I met um, were interested in working on this. I do also have like a biochemistry degree and did research for a while. And that's a marginally useful qualification, <laughs> probably less than than you would expect. Um, but I do have some background knowledge, which is not true of a number of other right. cause areas that are somewhat popular right now. Mm. Does any of your poker knowledge come in handy? I think the the primary way that poker knowledge comes in handy is just being able to think about risk and reward in ways that are quite counterintuitive to most people but become second nature to to poker players. So um, this comes up a lot in discussions of like catastrophic or existential risk where there'll be a really small probability of something very bad happening that could wipe out a significant proportion of the human race. But that would be so costly that it's worth focusing on that risk and trying to address it, even though it's really unlikely to happen. You know, a lot of pushback people give Mm -hmm. on anyone who's working on sort of low probability, but potentially bad, Mm -hmm. you know, very large risks is like, you're being Pascal's mugged, Mm -hmm. right? They're like, well, aren't you just falling victim to that same thing? You're wasting resources on a thing that's you know, if you think it's only a one in a thousand chance, mm-hmm. okay, sure, it might kill five billion people, but the one in a thousand is so small, go do something better with your time and money. Like, what's what would your argument be back I mean, against that? With that specific example, that's like a one in a thousand risk of five billion people dying is really, really high. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some people will tell, say why, why that's high, because there's some people that doesn't intuitively seem that way. Right. So a one in 1,000 risk of 5 billion people dying is sort of equivalent in value terms to a 100% chance of 5 million people dying. This is, they're not actually equivalent in many relevant senses, but this is a way that you can think about what the real cost is. It's not incorrect to think about it that way. Yeah, it's at least useful for guiding decision-making to to think in these terms. Um, And so if you think that saving 5 million lives is important and valuable and you sort of trust the assumptions that you're relying on in your analysis, it can really easily make sense to to do stuff with that kind of probability. Another aspect of this is that I don't think that I'm very susceptible to being mugged in this way relative to some people who take like certain forms of long-termism seriously. Like my experience personally, has convinced me that you just have to have sort of like a discontinuity in your thinking. You have to just be willing to say at some point that, you know, I'm not willing to take infinitely long odds for an infinite payoff or something. Um, You just can't. Even if there's like a good argument for it. You just just need a rule of thumb to say, no, I'm not not going to double double or nothing the universe. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think that like in reality right now, there are plenty of risks that are sufficiently macroscopic 
that it should be sort of uncontroversial to want to work on them, um, even if they have this like structure of low probability, um, mm. high value trade offs. I think, in addition to that, my personal view is that most people underestimate the risk of catastrophic biological events and that this is um, a relatively significant problem or relatively relatively significant risk um, and one that is going to increase pretty dramatically in the coming decade. And why is that? That's just because of democratization of technologies that can have exponential negative effects, basically. As in, like, more people have the ability to create or release some kind of very dangerous virus or yeah. something like that yeah. because of technologies getting cheaper and, and it's easier, you know, biosynthesis and so on. Yeah. yeah. You would expect that people be more concerned about pandemics seeing as we've just had, you right. know, this yeah. very disruptive event <laughs> over the last few years um, that has messed up so many people's lives and killed so many people. Mm -hmm. Um uh, you'd think people would be more sensitive to like uh, wanting to do more pandemic preparedness, but in some ways people are like, oh, well, we've got it out the way now, which is not <laughs> how this works. <laughs> Unfortunately, it means that probably our original predictions were off. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes more sense to be putting more effort in to like having better um, responses to it. People sometimes like to think about this question in a vacuum and, and think, do I think that this is the best use of my money? No, because it's a pretty remote risk. But if you think about like government and other spending as sort of directed toward a portfolio of technologies and, and useful things in the world, um, there is an enormous amount of money that's spent on stuff that is much less valuable. Um, and most people working in this area are just asking for a little bit of money to be spent on the thing that we've recently demonstrated could like shut down the world. Really shut down the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's a question of like where the money is currently going and where it could go versus like should should virus get all of the money or something like that. Right. No one's saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Just like can we just get a tiny fraction? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, like to me, a lot of these sort of existential risks uh, that we face, they kind of almost fall into two categories. You've got the classic ones that, you know, you see the movies about, which are an asteroid coming at mm -hmm. Earth or super volcano or even aliens or something like that, where it's like a kind of single external source of threat that we just need to figure out how to defeat. Mm -hmm. Um and certainly with something like an asteroid, like that is a real risk at some point. It's just that in my, in my mind, that's an easy X risk. And then we've got the hard X risks, which are the ones where it's actually coming from our own technology or our own sort of internal competitive dynamics, um, where we, our failure to coordinate is what's causing the problem in the first place. It's what's driving this like, you know, all progress mm -hmm. without the safety, for example. Um, you know, whether that's in bio, you know, biotech or AI mm -hmm. um, or any other new powerful um, technology that could be used either for good or for bad. Um, do you have any inkling of or any idea of like uh, the kind of questions we need to be asking ourselves in order to find, to, to, to slow these down or to find... To basically put Moloch in a box mm -hmm. or constrain it in some way. Mm -hmm. When it comes to sort of large-scale risks, a lot of these have the form of there are naturally offensive technologies and there are naturally defensive technologies. And part of the goal all the time is to reduce the pace at which offensive technologies are developed in order to let defensive technologies catch up. Um, and I think that. Uh, there are mechanisms for slowing down the, the development of the most dangerous things. So like an example in the virus context would be um, efforts to limit access to sequencing technology or synthesis technology um, where you can make the audience for those things 
limited to a certain smaller group of people, um, and this reduces the pr proliferation that's really the problem there. I think a lot of the pushback you hear from within the sort of progress forward scientific communities mm -hmm. is that, well, at least the, the argument that I often hear people make is like, yeah, but you're basically saying that you want to restrict information. You, you want to keep information more centralized as opposed to letting us democratize it and publish everything. Mm -hmm. um, and there is an argument that, you, that as a rule of thumb, we shouldn't be trying to, you know, we shouldn't be withholding information from people. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's very, it's a very elitist thing to do. Um, who gets to decide what information is safe to be disseminated versus not. Mm -hmm. There's an awful lot of power, right? Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to that? I think it's just extremely true that you want to limit access to certain types of information. A really good example of this that's come up recently is um, USAID's Deep Vision program, mm -hmm. which aims to go out into the wild, collect a ton of novel viruses that haven't been seen before, characterize them in a lab to see which ones are very likely to spread efficiently between humans and very likely to be fatal. And then publish a rank ordered list of the ones that are have highest pandemic potential um, openly on, on the web, the sequences for those things. And that describes me as like, or that, that, that feels to me like the, the argument ad absurdum of open access to information. Right. Like, that is so clearly a bad idea. Because you're essentially just, like, publishing the, the the building, like, the instruction manual of how to build weapons of mass destruction. Exactly. On the internet, which any terrorist cell or any bad actor or any psychopath or anyone can just get hold of. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked a lot about Moloch and all the bad things. But to finish up... I want to talk about win-win because Moloch is the god of lose-lose situations, mm -hmm. destructive competition. What's the opposite of that? It's win-win, the god of positive sum, games that make the world a better place. In any of your spiritual experiences, have you met anything that resembles that? The thing that feels closest for me to that concept is this sort of spiritual concept. Um, it's like the concept of, of a bodhisattva, which is basically that we're all responsible for helping one another spiritually improve in life. Um, and that is like the, the primary purpose of a moral being's life is to uh, aid other people in achieving sort of higher states of consciousness. Um, and I think that sort of, that reflects sort of a, a belief that one's well-being cannot be separated from the well-being of others. Mm -hmm. um, that concept is also reflected in a lot of other places in, in spiritual traditions. And I think that that recognition that advantaging ourselves at the cost of other people really isn't winning, really doesn't feel like winning, um, is an important one. Beautiful. There we go. Thank you so much for listening or watching whatever platform you're on. And huge thank you to Kate for opening up about what must be such a difficult topic. Please give her a follow. Uh, Twitter to use her most useful, most useful, most commonly used platform. And of course, please like, subscribe, share, scream from the rooftops, however you feel uh, to talk about the Win Win podcast. Make sure you catch the next one. There are some really exciting guests coming up uh, in the next few episodes. So ee, I love how this is starting to get the ball rolling. We got a podcast going. <laughs> I am going to stop talking now. Bye. Bye.